Good morning. Uh, Minister Shizaki, um, Professor Kurokawa of the World Dementia Council, uh, distinguished colleagues, friends, uh, it's an enormous pleasure to be with you here today at such an important event. As the Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government, it's a privilege to see so much activity cascade around the world as a result of those commitments made by our countries at the first ever G8 Dementia Summit in London last year. Before our eyes, global action against dementia is becoming a reality, with our countries working together to change lives. And I've had the great privilege of seeing this work grow over the past few years from the sort of germ of an idea to the global movement that we see today. In 2012, I was asked by Prime Minister Cameron to be one of uh, three dementia champions working in the area of research. And those champions had three ambitions. The first was to create dementia-friendly communities that understand how to help. The second aim was to drive improvements in health and in care. And the third was around improving the research effort. And at the time I first became involved, I was the director of the Wellcome Trust, a global charitable foundation which supports research in biomedicine and the medical humanities with the aim of improving human and animal health. And so there was no better topic than dementia. And standing here in Tokyo today, there is really nowhere better I could be to be able to take stock of all that has been achieved since then in what is really rather a short time. And as a result of your long-standing commitment in Japan to care for and to respect elders in the community, you have led the way for others to adopt your community-wide approach to supporting those who need it. And as we've already heard, the figures are remarkable. Over 5 million people, about 5% of the population in Japan, have now completed their dementia supporters training as volunteer supporters for the country's dementia-affected population with the aim to reach 6 million people by 2017. And it sounds to me as though you might get there even earlier. Um, given that one in four people in Japan is over 65, you've adapted to care for this growing part of your population in inspirational ways. And the circular support system that brings together people of all ages is something that we not only in the UK, but in the rest of the world can learn so much from. And we can also learn a great deal from your innovative technological solutions in caring for people with dementia and indeed older people more generally. Um, and as we'll see later today, Japan is at the cutting edge of technological advancement. Uh, but crucially, you bring the creativity to turn innovation in technology into real-life care solutions. And as we've already heard and heard from Dennis Gillings just now, the capacity now to bring loved ones and carers to be able to connect at the click of a switch by bringing robotic technology and computerized care systems into the home opens up huge possibilities of remote support and connectedness. And I think it's a very good example of how technology can help human connections. So it's not faceless robots, it's robots that actually enable the faces of loved ones to be brought directly into the room, wherever they are in the world. Um, and of course, in the long term, not only is this good for care, um, but it may as also be associated with cost savings and increased efficiency. And of course, one of the big challenges and opportunities is to keep people who have uh, cognitive impairment in their homes for as long as possible. So in the UK, we have taken your lead on raising awareness and reducing the stigma around dementia. And in 2012, we adopted the Dementia Friends program and now have over half a million dementia friends in England who have a much greater understanding of the condition, how they can recognize the symptoms and support people living in their community. And we're also working to develop dementia-friendly communities across the country, more than 70 of them so far, working to break down the stigma. And businesses, of course, are also an important part of this. And businesses from a range of sectors, including banking, retail, transport, have signed up so that their staff can support customers. And as the chairman of a well-known British bank put it very well, if my customer can't remember their PIN number, it's up to all of us to help. We owe it to them to support them through every step of the way. 
And of course, as we've heard also, the Dementia Friendly Initiative has now been adopted by Canada, who announced that they would become dementia friendly at the last legacy event in Ottawa in September. So if we can continue to spread the program around the G7 countries, we'd make a huge step forward towards the commitment made by our health ministers collectively in December last year to call upon civil society to continue and to enhance global efforts to reduce stigma, exclusion and fear. And since that G7 Dementia Summit in 2013, there's been significant progress, not only on that commitment to reduce stigma, but also in research working together to share information and to bring together academia and industry to turbocharge research efforts and be as innovative and creative as possible in looking for effective treatments. And the World Dementia Envoy and the Council have identified the key target areas where progress needs to be made in order to speed up the search for an effective treatment or cure to meet the 2025 deadline agreed by the G7. And as well as the work of the World Dementia Council, a number of other projects have taken off in G7 countries, including, for example, the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration in Aging, launched in Ottawa last September, that brings together public and private partners. Uh, we've established the UK Dementia Platform, again, a public-private partnership uh, with £12 million provided through the Medical Research Council and another £4 million provided by six UK and international companies. And overall, UK spending on dementia research is on track to reach over 66 million pounds in 2014 and 15, and that's a doubling of the amount spent in 2009 and 10. One of the unusual system, features of the UK support system for medical research and care in the UK is the very strong charitable sector. Um, and Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Research UK and the Alzheimer's Society each have announced a £100 million pledge and commitment to increase their spending on dementia research over the next 10 years. So a lot of progress. But despite all of this, I think we all recognize the scale and difficulty of this challenge. So there is so much more to do. Firstly, we need to be sure that we bring all of the sciences to bear, the social sciences, engineering, technology, as well as the biological and physical sciences. Because on our latest estimates, the 44 million people living with dementia today are set to almost double by 2030. And we're going to have ever-increasing parts of our populations in need of care and support. And of course, it's not only those that live with the condition, but their families and their carers that need support. So this needs to be at least as much about the social sciences as it is about molecular biology. Um, and of course, as I know from my own medical background, a dementia is a, a difficult condition which we don't fully understand. Given that we don't understand the mechanisms of normal cognition, how we think, which is one of the great challenges of modern biology and medicine, um, it's very understand, uh, hard to understand all of the biology of the dementias. Um, but it's also important to recognize that we can make a big difference and slow the onset of dementia by treating some of the factors that go along with dementia and accelerating it, like hypertension, high blood pressure, and managing diabetes. Because if we can do that, we can already make a big difference to dementia. So, Minister... Professor Kurokawa, ladies and gentlemen, our global action against dementia has made so much progress in just eight months. But in order to reach that target of effective treatment or prevention by 2025, we need to continue and to sustain that action at the pace we have now, or we'll let down those people who so badly need our help. So we have four months left of this commitment, and the clock is ticking, but let's make this a lasting commitment, maintain the momentum, and set our sights even higher. Thank you for your attention.